you've written a letter and you've mailed it. First class or air mail, United States or any place in the world. How your letter gets where you want it to go in the shortest possible time is the job of the Postal Transportation Service, whose 30,000 men are the backbone of the postal system. They keep the mail in motion. This is Bob Smith. Six months ago, he took a civil service examination for employment in the Postal Transportation Service and achieved a high grade. He also passed a rigid physical examination. This letter is an offer of employment as a substitute postal transportation clerk. Bob reports to the district transportation manager, who explains that the basic function of the Postal Transportation Service is to transport the United States mail to keep the mail moving toward its destination. Bob accepts the appointment, takes an oath to defend and uphold the Constitution of the United States. He is given the equipment necessary to protect the mail, to identify himself as a Postal Transportation Service clerk. His training period begins. He is assigned to a PTS terminal where the primary breakdown in the process of distribution is performed. There are 71 terminals in the United States, most of them located at railroad stations, all of them a maze of belts, chutes, corridors, elevators, and moving trucks. Bob is now one of the 10,000 terminal postal transportation clerks who keep the mail in motion from the time it is loaded onto the belts until it leaves the terminal properly dispatched by a train and trucks. In this terminal located in Washington, D.C., 10,000 sacks of mail are processed daily. This job requires hundreds of highly skilled distributors who work around the clock 365 days a year. But Bob has no knowledge of distribution and can only perform the more laborious work, pulling sacks from one truck to another, dumping up mail on a portable belt for distribution by experienced employees. It is a question of pull and lift and dump and dump. A tired substitute realizes that if he is to get away from this laborious work, he must learn something about the distribution and dispatch of mail. Like other postal transportation clerks, he spends countless hours studying the geographical locations, scheming out the correct routes for each of the 800 post offices in his examination assignment. Months later, Bob takes his first case examination. Postal transportation clerks must make a grade of at least 95 to pass. His equipment is inspected by the examiner. Revolver, keys, scheme book, and schedules. Every week, clerks must revise and restudy the ever-changing supplies and schedules. Bob is naturally apprehensive but he gives the signal and begins casing the cards. Off to a slow start, he gains speed and finishes at a rate of 32 cards a minute. The examiner checks the cards through the use of a code on the back. He finds eight errors out of 800 and points out the correct supply for each office in error. Bob receives a mark of 99%. He will continue to take examinations and his confidence will grow. Within three years, he will have a working knowledge of approximately 5,000 post offices. Having acquired considerable knowledge of distribution, Bob is assigned to a terminal where bulk mails are handled. On this simple distribution rack, sacks are made up for states and other terminals. Although he is working alone, he is part of a vast system where the performance of each individual affects every other individual. A jam up at any one point can cause serious problems throughout the entire organization. 
As the sacks are filled, they are labeled, tied out, and dispatched to the correct train for transportation to destination. Sacks of parcel post are dumped up on a portable belt, where clerks, working at high speed, make the primary breakdown for the various racks in the section. Parcels of all sizes and shapes are thrown into tubs, which go to the racks for distribution. During an eight-hour day, Bob processes the equivalent of 160 sacks of parcel post. The tubs from the portable belt are brought to him along with the word of encouragement and advice. When the mail is kept in motion, this vast terminal is a smooth and efficient operation. But the flow of mail varies, and the distributors are continually fighting against time to keep the mail moving. When the volume becomes too great and overtaxes the facilities of the terminal, there are delays and increased costs. Twelve billion pieces of third and fourth class mail are distributed and transported each year. A tremendous task requiring expert knowledge and close teamwork by postal transportation clerks. Airmail is another responsibility of the Bureau of Transportation. As preferred service, it costs more, but is well worth the money. An airmail letter from New York City is delivered in London, England, as quickly as a regular letter from New York reaches Chicago. Incoming airmail is delivered to the Postal Transportation Service by the airlines. Two important tools the Postal Transportation Clerk uses are the twine cutter to open and tie out packages and the thumb stall to put the letters into pigeonholes. The jargon used in the Postal Transportation Service is peculiar. For example, fill in north. Number one and number two means mail in these pigeonholes will be dispatched to a railway post office running between Philadelphia and Norfolk. The number one package will be worked first because it includes cities near the beginning of the run. Bob receives on-the-job training under the guidance of regular clerks. After the airmail has been distributed into the cases, the packages are tied out and sent to the pouch table where they are thrown into pouches of destination. Life at an airmail field is never static. Flight patterns are constantly changing. Planes are grounded and mail must be rerouted to trains and trucks. The airmail clerk must know the proper distribution and dispatch for airmail flights and surface transportation as well. This complex system of routing requires specialized skill and flexibility, which is peculiar to the industry. Around the clock and against time, they work to distribute and dispatch as much mail as possible on each flight. 800,000 airmail flights serving 550 cities carry one and one half billion pieces of airmail yearly. With America's great exodus to the suburbs, the highway post office has become a vital segment in the transportation of mail. HPOs not only transport mail, they also provide the facilities for distribution en route. Highway post offices are not restricted by the rigid schedules of railroads and airlines. Routes are set up to meet the individual requirements of the post offices served. The direct exchange of mails is both expeditious and economical, eliminating the need for mail messenger and star route service. The flexibility of the highway post office is the answer to the serious problem of providing good postal service during periods of shifting populations. At present, there are 184 HPO routes, which travel 15 and one half million miles yearly. The American people are on the move, and the highway post office is moving with them. This is Bob's first trip in a railway post office. The crew reports to the RPO car to perform advanced distribution before the train leaves. This RPO runs between Washington and Chicago. Pouches and sacks are strung along the car according to an official diagram to accommodate mail to be distributed and dispatched during the run. Each rack contains from 10 to 16 pouches or sacks. 
Each RPO car has a different layout because the scope of distribution varies for each run. Letter case headers are inserted in the pigeonholes for the city and state mail, which will be distributed and dispatched. Most transportation clerks work throughout the night so that mail will reach post offices early in the morning to ensure first delivery by letter carriers. Outside the car, there seems to be confusion as trucks to be loaded with mail are maneuvered into position, but actually everything is in order. A clerk calls out pouches in a jargon familiar only to the postal transportation clerks. Each run is scheduled to receive specific dispatches from post offices, airmail fields, highway post offices, and other railway post offices. A record is made of all pouches received and dispatched. The conductor gives the highball and the run begins. Nearly 18 billion pieces of first class and 6 billion pieces of second class mail are handled by the Postal Transportation Service yearly. As the momentum of the train picks up, letters are snapped into the pigeonholes with increased speed. The pouch table becomes the center of activity. There is a spray decor in the PTS that is unique. Working in small groups or crews, clerks develop a keen sense of teamwork, while competition between crews results in high productivity. The speed of distribution now has reached its peak and will continue at this pace until the train nears the end of the run. Each clerk understudies one or more assignments and can step in and fill a vacancy at a moment's notice. Each of these veteran clerks knows the proper distribution and dispatch for approximately 5,000 post offices. Clerks work not only against time, but against the sway and bounce of the speeding RPO car. One of the advantages of railway post office service is that it permits receipt and dispatch of mail en route. Good postal service to the smaller cities and towns along the run is accomplished on the fly. These are the most exciting moments of the run, particularly for the new man. The mail for dispatch, enclosed in a special pouch, is brought to the door. The clerk designated to make the throw and catch is on the lookout for familiar landmarks as the train approaches the point where the mails are exchanged. He watches for the crane on which the incoming pouch is held. He throws the pouch, lifts the catcher arm, and makes the catch. The pouch is brought to the pouch table and distributed quickly so that patrons of the next station may receive same-day delivery. Bob Smith has now satisfactorily completed his probationary year. A letter from his district manager offers him an assignment as a regular clerk in a PTS terminal. He is ready to take his place among those who have dedicated their lives to the principle that the mail must go through. The men of the Postal Transportation Service. The men who keep the mail in motion.